Hello, and welcome to your most obedient and humble servant. This is a women's history podcast where we feature 18th and early 19th century women's letters that don't always make it into the history books. I'm your host, Catherine Garrett. I'm very excited to be joined by a good friend of mine and a former colleague, Kate Johnson. Hello. Kate is an archival assistant at the University of Northern Colorado and has worked in museums and cultural institutions for over 10 years. She's also worked at several women's history focused archives and museums in the Chicago area. Can you tell me a little bit about what you do? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Sort of the main aspects to my job as an archival assistant are processing is a big one, which is where we're organizing the collections of historical materials so that um, researchers can can hopefully find what they're looking for and perhaps find what they didn't know they were looking for. (laughs) Helping patrons um, with research. And then a part of my job is also creating exhibits based on our archival material and um, developing programming to help bring students and, and members of the university community in. Cool. Very happy to have you with us. I decided since Kate and I used to work together at Monticello to pull out another Monticello relevant document. So this is another letter from one of Thomas Jefferson's granddaughters, Ellen Wales Randolph. This letter is from 1821 to her mother, Martha Jefferson Randolph. She's writing from Washington City, so Washington, D.C., but they call it Washington City at that time. Uh, So for a little bit of context, 1821, Thomas Jefferson's still alive at this point. He's uh, retired at Monticello. Uh, He doesn't die till 1826. Ellen herself is 25 years old at this point, and she's visiting uh, Washington for the social season. Um, I tried to find out exactly what prompted this visit, I found there was actually a little bit of drama about her departure from Monticello. She sort of left on impulse. We have a letter that she writes November 19th, and she says, I've been continually uneasy about the state in which I left you, my dearest mother. So I tried to figure out what was going on there. Uh, She and her sister's fiance, Nicholas Trist, and his brother, Hor Browse Trist, who they call Browse, left Monticello in November. It seems like somebody in the family was sick. Uh, And it also seems, because I found a letter from Virginia that Virginia wrote to her fiance, Nicholas, where she apologizes for her temper and how she was ashamed that that was the last impression of her that she had left with him. I suspect, oh dear. I suspect that Virginia was a little bit annoyed that Ellen was going on this trip and <laughs> so she was seems. not. That's also really cute, the letter that uh, Ellen writes, because she talks about she's in this really long carriage ride with Nicholas and his brother. And I guess they both fell asleep on her shoulders. This is all just setting up like a rom-com or a Jane Austen novel. Right? This uh, Yes. So Ellen is visiting Washington for the social season. There's going to be a lot of parties, a lot of events, but it doesn't seem like things have really kicked off yet. And she is visiting with her cousin or with her aunt, Mary Randolph. So this is her father's sister, Mary Randolph. She uh, is the author of a Virginia housewife cookbook, which is a little bit famous. It's the sort of thing that they like get recipes from Colonial Williamsburg from. And she used to run uh, a tavern, Mary Randolph. Uh, But her husband was a Federalist not a Democratic Republican, which obviously is Thomas Jefferson's party. And Ellen, as much as she would say she would not talk about politics very much, was definitely a Democratic Republican. And I think that a little bit of the tensions of the political situation at the time comes through in Ellen's letter. Uh, Would you agree with that, Kate? Yes, yeah. Also, Ellen does write a letter to her grandfather, Thomas Jefferson, with some political news. So that letter is dated two days earlier from this. So this is right in the thick of what's going on at this time. And she actually does write political news. And she mentions General Jackson, who at this point, so that's Andrew Jackson, he was governor of the Floridas. And he was in the newspapers because he was in a power dispute with Judge, oh, don't know how to say this name either, but it's (laughs) Elijah. Allegis Fromentine. And this is a very significant historical moment because the issue is that Andrew Jackson is fighting over the powers that he has as a governor in Florida. Uh, and he is setting himself directly opposite President Monroe and Secretary of State John Quincy Adams. So I wanted to mention that a little bit just to give an idea of the political situation that's going on and what everybody's talking about in Washington City at this time. Did you mention the, that she's that she's single and sort of... Oh, thank you. Yeah, good yes. point. So Ellen being 
25 years old, unmarried. And so part of the reason that she would be in Washington City at the social season is to try to find a husband. And also, men in Washington might also be looking for spouses just to try to get good political jobs. She's kind of a prime target. There are a lot of office seekers there that are trying to marry into a family like Thomas Jefferson's, uh, and which is exactly the kind of nepotism that Andrew Jackson <laughs> was so angry about. <laughs> and you can really see it in action in this letter. <laughs> Exactly. Okay, okay. So that, I think, should be enough context. And so I will get started with the letter. So this is Ellen Wales Randolph to Martha Jefferson Randolph, Washington, December 14th, 1821. I have always observed, my dearest mother, that your letters have a secret charm, a spell by which vapors and blue devils are speedily expelled. In whatever mood I may be, to hear from you is like a dose of ether to an hysterical patient. I am at once animated, <laughs> revived, <laughs> and things and persons appear in a more amiable point of view. My prospects brighten, and my hopes prevail. Yesterday I felt rather dismally. The day was gloomy and cold. A mingled fall of snow and rain kept everyone within doors. Aunt R. was out of spirits, and of course a little out of humor. For you know that in the Randolph family, there is no separating these states of mind. She had been very unwell a few days before, and the first symptoms of a relapse showed themselves in the unusual asperity with which she spoke of men and things. She was evidently feverish and threatened with serious indisposition. All of these things combined, as you may suppose, could produce no very exhilarating effect on me, a poor prisoner, particularly as I was debarred from all employment. Sewing work I could not see to do except at the cold window, and reading or writing would have shown a want of relish for Aunt R's society and conversation." Just in this state of affairs, your dear welcome letter arrived, and, sorry as I was to hear of the mischief I have done in a certain quarter, <laughs> it gave me a sensation of gladness, of joy, which it is not very often my lot to experience. It invigorated me so completely that when Aunt R became really ill and obliged to send for a physician, I still felt light and happy in comparison to what I had done a few hours before. She is confined to her bed today, and I am writing from her sick room. Her complaint was a violent pain in the side, accompanied by fever, and I should have been considerably alarmed if I had not felt a conviction that it was an affectation of the stomach, and I have been confirmed in this belief by the nature of Dr. Hunt's prescription and by the sang Freud with which she behaves. <laughs> she is, however, certainly very sick, and I am not without uneasiness on her account. She herself seems convinced that she is in great danger. I have tried to soothe and reason her out of this idea, but there is no reasoning with nerves and she resents as an injury any attempt to bring about a more comfortable state of feeling, so I am fain to let her repeat that she is sure she shall die, although I am by no means impressed with the idea that she is in danger of anything more than suffering and discomfort for some time to come. Oh, she's so dramatic. <laughs> Great. <laughs> And I, I love, too, how she um, kind of makes fun of the Randolph side of the family, <laughs> where she's like, was out of spirits and, of course, a little out of humor, for you know that in the Randolph family, there's no separating these states of mind. Oh, I can't back this up, but I think there are some letters where people in the family describe if you're having a bad day as sort of having a case of the Randolphs. <laughs> yeah, that uh, I, I believe that. I believe that. <laughs> So it's it's nice to see it sort of in action. I like she's she's didn't want to show a want of relish for Aunt R's society and conversation, <laughs> but I'm getting the impression that she might not have actually enjoyed it very much. <laughs> she doesn't think very much of her illness. Yes. <laughs> the thing I like about that though, and and we'll and we'll see more more of this in the letter, is that it's so obvious she has such a close relationship with her mother. Yes. Like they are very clearly there's trust. She doesn't have any qualms about telling her mother exactly what she thinks and, you know, or looking bad or being impolite sort of in front of her mother. And and I kinda I kinda love that they have that relationship. I did enjoy what she says. Some secret charm or a spell by which vapors and blue devils are speedily expelled. <laughs> and uh to hear from you is like a dose of ether to an hysterical <laughs> patient. Oh my goodness. The first time I read this I busted up laughing after the hysterical patient line. I did look this up because I listened to not to name drop a podcast within a podcast, but I listened to a medical <laughs> history podcast called Sawbones and their episode on ether is really good. And I was like, I didn't think they used ether medically yet, but this really seems to imply that it is a dose yes. of ether to an hysterical patient but it wasn't used as a like a numbing agent yet that wasn't until like the 1840s but so at this point it's still just something that people are either taking for fun or like something to calm somebody down 
Which, yeah, that, that I, I kind of I poke fun of her because she talks about, you know, if it's a hysterical patient, like it's a calming down. But in her very next sentence, she's like, I'm at once animated and revived. <laughs> I was like, well, it's the exact opposite effect of that particular drug, but it's fine, Ellen, carry on. <laughs> You're mixing your metaphors here, Ellen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and I did want to point out, I was able to look up who uh, Dr. Hunt was. Uh, he was a rather big deal physician at this time. Um, his name's Henry Hunt, MD. I can give you his exact address, which none of you care about. He was living in Washington, D.C. directory at the east side of 14 West between Pennsylvania Avenue and F. And he was a health officer of the city. So she's not just calling a doctor, she's calling a pretty significant doctor which makes sense considering their family status yeah that's who she would get Mm -hmm. into the next bit i expected you would be somewhat curious on the subject of my unknown lover and intended to keep you for a while in suspense i knew that when once a disclosure was made the bubble would burst parturian montes nascitur ridiculous (laughs) moose This is some Latin that she threw in there. And Kate, can you say what this sentence means in English? I would I would be glad to. It translates to mountains will be in labor and an absurd mouse will be born. <laughs> <laughs> mountains will be in labor and an absurd mouse will be born. Okay. So this sighing Stephen, who can do nothing but make indifferent love and play a still more indifferent game of chess, and who two days after the adventure of the song and just before leaving Washington came to a formal declaration of his passion, at the same time acknowledging he should find some difficulty in maintaining a wife and postponing the positive demand of my hand until his return from South America, where he is going post-haste to make a fortune in less time than ever a fortune was made by man, who has no wish to lay his bars of silver and ingots of gold, his precious stones and pearls of price, and all the precious commodities with which he proposed to return full laden at the feet of the most charming of the sex. If, in the meantime, some happier man steps not in with a fortune ready made, and with a pen of gold writes not his own name upon this fair blank paper, which it would seem has a sort of repellent quality, forbidding the approach of any metal less precious. This man, I say, after a parenthesis as long, if not quite as eloquent as any of Cicero's or Aunt C's, is no less and no greater a person than a certain William Taylor of Norfolk, brother to that General Taylor of long-winded memory, who married the elder sister of Elizabeth Lindsay and was formerly in the habit of visiting us at Monticello, a greater bore even than his brother. This explains the W.T. upon the seal which the officious zeal of my knight-errant clapped on my letter to Cornelia. I know nothing earthly of this man. He may have been a shoe-black or a blackleg for aught I was aware of, and I therefore consider his addresses as highly impertinent and derogatory to my dignity. However, he is upon the most intimate footing in Colonel Freeman's family, who was for a long time the officer in command on the Norfolk station, and should therefore know who is who. Okay, what do you think of that? Gold. All of it. We have our first proposal description, and boy is it, she is not nice. She does not think much of Mr. Taylor. We don't have the letter. She mentions that there was a, a letter with a seal to Cornelia, so I imagine that might have been something that caused a little bit of hubbub at the household. Yes. I'm so, uh, I don't know if impressed is the right word, by his boldness. And being like, oh, I see you're writing a letter home. Shall I seal it for you with my seal? How gracious of you. (laughs) That's not weird at all. (laughs) Way to, like, stamp your claim, man. (laughs) Quite literally. And I can only imagine what they thought getting this letter that's supposed to be from Ellen with somebody else's seal on it. Seal on it? Yeah. (laughs) What has she been getting up to? <laughs> so I imagine that is what her Latin quote was talking about, where she's saying mountains are in labor only to yes. produce a ridiculous mouse, where she's saying it looks like something like a big deal happened, but it's actually just ridiculous. It's, it's sort of a, a, a building up of expectation and then the reality not really meeting that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I looked up. The poor, unfortunate William Taylor, who did not get a very complimentary introduction from Ellen. He appears to be a distant cousin of James Madison. So he is part of the sort of Virginia gentry class, but doesn't seem like he's 
made too much of a dent in the history books, at least yet. But I know for sure it's this guy because he was appointed to be the U.S. consul to Veracruz and Alvarado in Mexico in 1823. So he must have just gotten this appointment, and that's given him a little bit of perhaps the motivation to try to also sort of stake his claim in the Jefferson family a little bit, proposing to Ellen, not realizing that she just thinks he's ridiculous. (laughs) She's sort of making fun of the fact that he doesn't think he has enough money to uh, be with her yet. But then she also very much is like, he doesn't have enough money. <laughs> yeah, she's. it's funny. It, she does that a number of times in this letter. I find the insight into Ellen's personality in this letter uh, a lot of fun. The other point here, I, <laughs> I like that one of the things she mocks him for is his indifferent game of chess. <laughs> she's like, I don't know who this guy is. I don't know what he does. I think he's impertinent. And also, he plays chess poorly. Oh, an, an indifferent game of chess. And then he makes indifferent love, too. That is just brutal. Going through this letter, you know, it was, it was fun to kind of think back on, on my Monticello knowledge, which I don't get to, to use as much anymore. And But what I do remember of Ellen, she was very smart and she knew it. Yeah. Um, and I feel like she enjoyed sort of thinking of herself as the smartest person in the room. A lot of times, which, of course, is a trait I would say she she picked up at home. (laughs) You know, and she's, I think she kind of thrived in some of the intellectual atmosphere that, like, her grandfather cultivated. You know, even though, you know, of course, as a woman, it's, there's some barriers there. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) She's not truly allowed to be a full participant in some ways, but um, she writes well. She writes very witty. She writes very to the point. Yes. Um, she does sort of have this Elizabeth Bennett quality and this sort of like laughing at the world a little bit. Yes. Even though, like you say, some of it she like actually feels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's just like such a Southern belle. All right. So that's the romance portion. Now we're going to get <laughs> back into the letter. And this is just sort of the social news. I do not think Susan Irvin is quite as fond of me as she appeared before, but this may be fancy. And the whole family pay me the most friendly attentions. Colonel Freeman, to be sure, is rough and rugged as a Russian bear, but he seems fond of me, says I am the best little girl in the world, just as good as it is in the nature of a woman to be, which, to be sure, is always a doubtful kind of goodness, that I have a pair of the sweetiest, sauciest little eyes he ever saw, and he makes no matter of doubt that I have done a great deal of mischief with them, and am right sorry not to have done still more. Nicholas told me I should find him a rough old soldier, but true to the core, he speaks often of Grandpapa and always with an acknowledgement of obligation. He says Mr. Jefferson was the cause of his being promoted and kept in. I know not to what he alludes particularly. Mrs. Freeman says she was of a Quaker family in Philadelphia, that at the time of the yellow fever, Grandpapa inhabited a country house on the banks of the Schuylkill, or Delaware, I forget which, that he returned to Virginia and allowed her father, or uncle, I forget again, in his absence, to inhabit the house, to which the family removed from the infected air of the city, and this she remembers with gratitude. I have been miserably disappointed in the veils, and yet I know not why. The girls are certainly accomplished, and so are the young men, and they all sing and play and dance and draw wonderfully well, and everybody says they are charming, and I echo charming, and yet there are no people whose society gives me less pleasure. Whether it is that as they have dwelt among the gay and frivolous and learned to speak English from these associates, they have acquired only the commonplace language of the fashionables and are unable to express any other than commonplace ideas, or whether, with all their accomplishments, they are deficient in the charm of mind, I cannot tell. To me also they appear all show and outside work, and so slippery withal that there is no laying hold of them. They all appear cast in the same mold, both as to mind and manners, and whether this resemblance is so great as to deceive with regard to their persons, or does really exist in matter as well as manner, but I have never yet learned to distinguish the girls from one another, and I know the men from the women only by the difference of pantaloon and petticoat. Burn. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Clementina is the younger and fresher in person, and Aaron is of a... The next part of the letter is a little bit damaged, um is of a blank and more satirical temper than the others, and I have been able to discover no other variety. When I add to this that they, blank, give me the proof of merit, you will readily imagine that, blank, generally dispense with their society. I have heard nothing of the trysts since the letter which Nicholas wrote, the day after his arrival at Wheeling, except through the veils. 
Lieutenant Vale left Washington two days after Nicholas and Browse, whom he joined at Wheeling, and he wrote to his friends there that they were to leave the place together in short time after the date of his letter, which was November 29th. So that was sort of the social news. Gosh, she's mean to the Vales. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I wasn't able to identify every single veil. Apparently, neither was Ellen. <laughs> um, <laughs> no kidding. It was a family. So this was the family of Aaron Vale, the U.S. commercial agent at Lorient, France. Um, he died in 1815. So his family, which had all been born and raised in Paris, uh, all returned to Washington at this point. So they were sort of new in the area. That makes sense. Because I was wondering where they were from if she's saying they learned their English from gay frivolous... Uh, <laughs> people. She just really calls them like charming airheads. Yeah, it, and I don't. Again, I can't tell you if that's fair. It seems Aaron Vale Jr., the son, um, who she mentions, possibly has he has a more satirical temper than the others. Ah, okay. So he actually ended up being a, a diplomat just like his father. Um, and he in the 1830s becomes Secretary of Legation in London. So he has a long, prosperous career. But most of the time when you're trying to look up the veils, it's actually through mentions that Ellen's making of them. So I was looking at the Dolly Madison papers, and when it's identifying the veils, they mention that Clementina, who's actually named Clementine, uh, she ends up becoming a nun a few years later. It identifies her, and it always says, oh, all of the veils were really good friends with Ellen. <laughs> like, that basically, oh. <laughs> they're, oh. <laughs> they're identified by their relationship with Ellen as being such good friends. Ellen specifically. Oh gosh, that's so sad. <laughs> yes, and every mention I've read has had a, included a quote from Ellen about the veils, but like all these positive quotes that she's writing to other people who are not their mother. So it's so funny because <laughs> apparently they're BFFs. This must be early on in their friendship. Perhaps they they grow on her. Otherwise, I kind of otherwise I kind of have this sense that almost like they're the exchange students <laughs> and like. <laughs> She's like befriending them because she thinks it's the right thing to do, but she doesn't actually understand them. Yeah, that that completely makes sense. <laughs> the um, she can't tell any of the part. She can't tell any of the part. <laughs> Just the difference of pantaloon and petticoat. Dang, Ellen. But again, so well written. Yes. Such a concise and witty burn she should have been like an insult comic if she was born at a later time um other people mentioned oh so susan irvin she mentions in passing i wasn't able to look up susan irvin colonel freeman uh i'm pretty sure is constant freeman he was a former revolutionary war soldier it seems like from the way that they're writing about him that this is the same guy uh i was trying to look up the identity of his wife mrs freeman and i just have to tell you this is one of those things i ran into there are apparently two constant freemans who both got married within three years in boston because there's so many wedding records for Constant Freeman. So he's either marrying like a ton of different women <laughs> who are just like either passing away and he's marrying another one within like a year span or there's two Constant Freemans. So I just decided I'm not even going to try to identify which which one she is. However, I did find another hint if one of you genealogists out there wants to dig up and solve this mystery. <laughs> she says she's of a Quaker family in Philadelphia. Uh, and she also says that Thomas Jefferson... Uh, let her father or uncle, so again, <laughs> more mystery, <laughs> uh, rent or stay in his house after he left uh, Philadelphia because of the yellow fever. And I was able to find the letter from Thomas Jefferson offering the house to a man named Moses Cox. Her father or uncle, Moses Cox, might give you a maiden name that you'd be able to identify this person. So that's the Freemans. Oh, and what, what's your impression of Colonel Freeman from Ellen's oh. description? Oh my gosh. The sweetest, sauciest little eyes. Oh, <laughs> whoa, man. Back it up. Chill out, old man. <laughs> yeah. Like, and it's, fun, it's funny reading this. It was like, I could just imagine, imagine him as being one of those older gentlemen who thinks of themselves as harmless and says these kinds of things and just makes everyone uncomfortable, but they're just oblivious to it. And that's, I guess she is breaking hearts with those eyes. But, that, that's, uh, that's true. I guess she is causing mischief with her. I just, that, that sweetest, sauciest little eyes. And 
I double checked and double checked that it was sweetiest, and it is. So that's why I read it that way. <laughs> and I'm sure she wrote it as it was spoken to her. <laughs> yeah, totally. Another thing that's fun about reading um, women's letters like this specifically is Colonel Freeman shows up in other historical documents and he's described in things and you'll just see things like he was a career soldier you hear these like very professional yeah. descriptions of people and then you read about him from a woman's perspective and in he's the social yeah like in a social context in a social context and it's like that old creep <laughs> i love when i come across somebody in like an encyclopedia entry that i've only read about from these women's letters yes. and i was like oh that weirdo right it is and it's such a freeing kind of a thing I guess in a way because I, I guess what I mean is like you read about these people in the history books or whatever and they're like these towering figures right and yeah you read this and you're like oh my gosh they were socially awkward <laughs> you know or just like you know they, they were they were as human as anybody yes right yeah it's their personality yeah, yeah. <laughs> not just their resume okay so here's the next the next section I have never yet heard the price of my bonnet and coat I enclosed a $50 note to Carrie Ann and begged that she would let me know how much more would be necessary, as she was to have an evening dress made for me besides, but I have not heard a word from her since, and feel quite uneasy about the fate of my note, the receipt of which has not yet been acknowledged. I am also afraid I shall not have my dress in time for Madame de N's, and that's Madame de Neuville, Madame de N's great party next Wednesday, which will be my first appearance in public since that English brute excluded me from his filthy something crossed out den. <laughs> My police is very pretty indeed, but I am afraid exceedingly delicate. It both spots and rubs rough, and I fear can only be used in great occasions. The bonnet is pure white and will stand no service, although it is very tasty and French-looking. But these things are between ourselves. The coat has been very much admired. A young pert clerk's son to the postmaster Monroe, the Whitcroft breed, said to a gay, flashy grocer's wife, there goes Colonel Freeman's carriage and a very handsome lady in it. Who is she? I do not know who she is, returned the grocer's lady, but I know she has got on the prettiest police that ever I saw. The woman is absolutely devoid of sentiment, said the clerk with a languishing air, to think of her talking about the police. But better judges than Madame la Pisserie have been of the same opinion touching on the comparative merits of my person and of my coat. December 15th. I had written thus far last night when I was interrupted by a visit from my friend Mr. Dix, who would really be a charming fellow were it not for his extreme absence of mind and expression of profound melancholy. And R is decidedly better, passed a very good night, and admits that she will probably recover, particularly as she is preparing to rise after having taken her breakfast. I received another invitation from Mrs. Senator Brown to a party at her house on Monday. I mentioned writing to Jane, my despair at not having had it in my power to accept the first, my spirits rise at the thought of slipping my prison bars and once again making my entree into the fashionable world. Adieu, my dearest, best-loved mother, so long as I think you will pardon my egotism, I have no pleasure so great as writing to you. A great deal of love to all the family, a thousand kisses for Septimia and Geordie, and for yourself, the assurances of my devoted attachment. End. So uh, she gets a little bit, uh, she's describing something about a grocer's wife and a police. So could you, in modern language, Kate, tell me what's going on there? <laughs> so she's talking about her jacket, her coat. The police is a type of coat. So she's she's describing the the quality of it and that she's not as happy with the quality, but that it's very pretty. And then, if I understand this correctly, she's describing the, uh, a conversation uh, of two people on the street one of them being a grocer's wife, <laughs> that they're commenting on on her in the carriage, which which makes sense, you know, again, being this sort of social setting that they're, you know, everyone's paying attention to who's in town and, and, and everything. <laughs> and so she she's sort of like making fun of them commenting on her pretty jacket. But I think it's quite hilarious that while she, she may be kind of poking fun at them, she does recount their conversation like word for word. And I have to, I'm embarrassed to admit that as I was going through and doing my normal trying to identify the people named in a letter, I did try to find a Madame Le Pissori. Uh I thought that was her name. It basically translates to Madame Le Grocery. <laughs> Ellen's just being a little mean again. Yeah. I was like, What's the big deal, Ellen? What do you care if 
a grocer's wife likes your coat. <laughs> <laughs> she's like both disdains that someone on the street would like of of not of her class, I guess, <laughs> would be like, It's a beautiful coat or like it's like, what would she know of the quality of my coat? But notice how she thought it was good. It's, it's sort of like the coat's prettier than the lady, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Which, oh, uh... oh, I see. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, okay. Okay. Because I, I was like, I'm not sure why she's so annoyed. I think that's how she took it because th- it might almost be a little bit of self-deprecation at the end where she says better yes. judges may have had the same opinion on the comparative par- yes. uh, <laughs> merits of my person and of my coat. <laughs> yes. She's more coat than woman. Oh, I did want to go into a little bit about the English brute and Madame yeah. Neuville. So Madame de Neuville was a very much like the Washington socialite at this time. She and her husband were royalists who were exiled from France and they came to the United States and held like the parties that you wanted to be at. But if you try to find out more about her herself, she was actually, it seems like Madame de Neuville wasn't really into that whole social life thing. She just sort of did it because she had to. Yes. But you can just feel Ellen's mood getting better at the end of the letter when she has more events to look forward to <laughs> yes <laughs> and it's she's happy to have been invited to this one because i was trying to figure out who the heck the english brute was yeah. who excluded her from his filthy den this is stratford canning uh the envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary to the united states from england uh from 1819 to 1823 so i really tried to find the specific event where he snubbed Ellen. I can't find it. Uh, But later, Ellen writes to uh, Jefferson where she says he actually has good manners. Uh, He he must have just, like, made a mistake earlier on. So I think, like, he forgot to invite her to something and she was furious at him. But then he later was able to make up for it. Because he had been... It wasn't like uh, he was politically against... Like oh, okay. the Jefferson family at like as this is happening, this exact moment that Ellen is writing, uh, Stratford Canning is working very closely with Monroe on the Monroe Doctrine. If he snubbed her, maybe he was just a little preoccupied. Yes, <laughs> and didn't didn't realize Jefferson's granddaughter was in town. Yes, I think I think it actually was. Um, she says she doesn't think it was. Here it is. The neglect I have experienced from Mr. Canning has proceeded more from some absurd ideas of etiquette than from any intentional disrespect. He is generally considered a man of amiable temper and manners, although devoured by hypochondria. <laughs> She has no she has no patience for hypochondriacs. <laughs> yeah, she really doesn't. <laughs> okay, sorry. That, that's also a very Ellen sentence. Uh, he is generally considered a man of amiable temper and manners, although devoured by hypochondria and constitutional melancholy. <laughs> uh, when we meet in society, we are always as sociable as he knows how to be. <laughs> <laughs> and end it with a backhanded compliment. <laughs> Nicely done, Ellen. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, so I don't think she 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 uh she really turned around too much on him, but he's no longer a brute. He just she's, yeah. he's as he's as sociable as he knows how to be. She's no longer having to cross out words in her description. Of him. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, something in here that that caught me when I was there a couple things in this section that caught me when I was reading it. Uh, one is I think it's hilarious that she talks about owing her sister money for clothes. Yes. Her sister won't tell her how much money she owes. <laughs> That it's like that is such a relatable thing. And then the part where she talks about her oh yes, her pure white bonnet. <laughs> How it's very tasty and French looking, but very impractical. Uh <laughs> which <laughs> cracked me up and also kinda of made me wonder. I was like, Oh, is Ellen Ellen did she get inherit her, her grandfather's Francophile ways? Because Jefferson, of course, is is well known for his his love of, of French things. Yes. Uh, if you walk into Monticello, it is like a French house. <laughs> yes, very much so. <laughs> so was there something as you're going through this letter that you're like, wow, that is very relatable. I I feel where you're coming from, Ellen. <laughs> One thing that, that kind of struck me um, was Ellen's experience uh, with the suitor. Yeah. was something that I could kind of identify with in that Essentially, she's she's taking pleasure in relating um, what's what's kind of like a bad first date, right? <laughs> like, 
<laughs> the best part of a bad date is getting to later regale your friends with the story. <laughs> and that's kind of what she's doing. You know, we complain in modern day about how much dating sucks. Um, but but frankly, finding that kind of connection has, has always been a hard thing. Yeah. Um, even though, of course, in Ellen's time, there's some very different layers of pressure and expectations going on and, and different ideas about what constituted a, a good partner. Mm. But, uh, but nevertheless, trying to find that, that right match it just has always involved experiencing some uncomfortable uncomfortable moments in the search. Uh, um, and is there anything that just sort of struck you as like very alien and different? I guess the, the most obvious thing difference that came to mind for me reading this was was just that Ellen was so limited in what she could do in society as an adult woman. Um, you know, she's she's playing the society games of going to parties and making connections with the the right people, and and keeping a tally of who snubbed her family. Um, <laughs> yeah. But other than sort of taking pleasure in the the humor of relating these these happenings, she doesn't seem to actually enjoy the process that much she's kind of bored with she sounds just kind of bored with it in some points um and she's we talked about she's kind of uh in low spirits in this letter for for a number of reasons you know she's kind of bored at her her relative's house and she left under weird circumstances yeah uh, <laughs> and all of that's going on but just as we've been talking throughout this uh she's just She's so smart and she's so witty and she writes so well. And I just, I found myself as I was reading, thinking about this, like, man, if she had, if careers had been an option for her, she would have been a force of nature. Yeah, totally. She would be running something. That's for sure. She'd be in charge of something. (laughs) Uh, Outside of um, just writing really sick burns. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Anything surprise you? The thing that kind of surprised me was uh, was her humor. Yeah. Um, and just, gosh, and just how much joy she, she took from. She, you, you get that sense from this letter that she just, she really took a lot of enjoyment out of relating these stories with a sense of humor. And um, I have to say, I think humor, like as a historian, humor is one of those is one of the tougher boundaries to try and overcome when you're reading historical documents, um, because it can just be very tricky to gauge. I mean, tone in writing, just period, can be tricky to gauge. Yeah. When you're, you've got these extra layers of historical language and historical mindsets, humor can be, like especially sarcastic humor, which Ellen employs quite a bit here, <laughs> um, can be very hard to pin down. But But she's done it in such a way that for the most part, I feel like I'm following along quite fine. With the, just, yeah, the level of wit, I wasn't expecting that, and it was wonderful. <laughs> I, I make fun of her for being obnoxious at points, but I'm like, oh, I'd probably be writing like this, too. <laughs> uh, well, all right. Kate, thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. It has been a great pleasure to talk about this letter um, and just get to unpack the the fun historical insights and just the plain old fun things yeah and, uh yeah i i'm such a fan of, of what you're doing with this project i think it's i think it's wonderful oh thank you so much so uh the text of this letter i will make available in the show notes for people who are interested i'll try to provide some of the other notes that i was able to dig up in my research so feel free to check that out and once again i am without question your most obedient and humble servant thank you very much